out there. Let me get married then go in here. Let me see if I can figure out who all's in here. Have it all set up different this time, so let's check this out. <laughs> uh, it looks like whoops, I better turn that one off. Huh? Oh, I gotta put this in over here. Echoey. Uh, yeah, I'm fixing it. There we go. Just got to turn it off. That's why I said I have it all set up different tonight. So everything always does that box to me. Now I should be able to get the roll call. All right, I got Kyle. I got Cheryl. I got Josh Connor. Uh, let's see who else? Uncle Al's in here. Hey, how you doing, Uncle? Uh, let's see. Hey, Uncle Al. Crafty ass Shaq Jude. How you doing? That's one of my new subscribers. Crafty ass Shaq. Yep. Hope I didn't tear that up too bad. Hey, Detroit. Uncle. Detroit fripping. Hey, what's up, Detroit? Hey, Detroit. And Brandon Hirsch. And Gavin. Hello, Gavin. Gavin made hey, it. Gavin. He's been telling me he's been beating himself up because he hasn't been able to make it. Glad you hey, made it, Gavin. Hey, Crafty Jack Zood or Jude. <laughs> yeah. Jude. Melissa Reborn. I got nursery. Hello. I'm sorry about that, you guys. My screen is really light that I'm reading off of. Wood Outdoors. And at the 48. I think that's everybody. If I did not call your name, make sure that you're lighting it up in red so that we can get your name called out. GM Survival. I see you there now. All hey, right, Gavin. so last week we left off. We were talking about... Uh, assimilating your group and then starting to grow your group from there but we ran out of time and we couldn't cover everything so what we're going to try to do tonight is we're going to try to cover what we didn't last week and try to get through it this week i see matt came in how are you doing matt you want a link if you want hey, a link matt. let me know so uh that's what we're going to try to get going from we're going to start off with agriculture so, you know, you've got your group set up now. We've assimilated all the groups and we've got the group growing. And we have the plan put in place, the parameters. But now you have to start putting uh, people together in smaller groups so that you can make everything work. In order to do that, you're going to have to uh, have a group that does like the farming, I guess, would be the right way to put it. People that actually went out and put the seeds in the ground, cultivate it up, gather it up, you know, all that stuff. So that is part of what we need to talk about tonight. We have several things on the list, so we're going to spend about, oh, 10, 15 minutes on each one. If uh, we need to have a little bit more on each one, then that'll be fine, too. We want to make sure that you guys over there in the side chat uh, are asking questions or even adding to the conversation. So, all right, great, Matt. Thanks for letting me know. I would have sent you a link. So, with that said, why don't you lead it off, uh, Anthony? All right. <clears throat> well, hey, how's everybody doing? Hope everybody is doing well. Um, the, the main thing I want to hit here when we're talking about agriculture, uh, and, I, and I'm sure everybody will agree, is this the importance of, you know, having nutrition, at least growing enough calories is going to be uh, absolutely important in terms of not only for staving off things like uh, scurvy, that kind of stuff and disease, but it's going to be important just to make sure that you can continue on doing everything else. Uh, a lot of people like to have a fantasy that there's going to be running and gunning and all that fun stuff. But in reality, if you don't have the calories, you're not running anywhere. So I guess the, the main thing I really want to hit on here is the fact that 
everybody should anticipate being in the fields, growing something at some point. Um, sure, you can stash away a lot of calories to get you to that point to where your garden or whatever is ready. Uh, but that's the way you want to think about it. You don't want to automatically assume just because I have a closet full of stuff, I'm good. Uh, you have to, if we are in that situation, you have to consider the fact that uh, growing your own food is is going to have to happen. So agriculture, for sure, uh, definitely one of those things where you can't overlook it. And if you can now, I mean, grow a little garden. That way you can learn what crops work well in your climate or um, the little, I mean, each plant has its own little, you know, things that work well or don't work. Like you can't grow broccoli in hot weather. Uh, you can't grow lettuce in hot weather, you know, tomatoes and basil and all that stuff die even on light frost, uh, that kind of thing. You know, just little things that you don't realize is you really can't read in books until you start growing. Uh, these are the things that you want to get out of the way now to, you know, get ready for when the time actually does happen. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, you know, as we're now that as we're starting to grow our group, you may have people in and out of that agriculture end of it because everybody should know what they're doing. It, it's going to make a, a big difference. It's like Anthony said, you're some crops won't grow it will depend on the area that your group that you have your group in if your group is uh say in texas you may have more than one growing season or if you're down in the deep south you may only have one growing season and you want to make the best out of that season and grow just what you can grow there and then whatever you're growing you want to make sure that you're eating that you know sure you're going to have your food stuffs put together you know your preps are going to be put together those are what you live off of until you get things like the agriculture end of it going and that kind of leads us into the next one of raising the animals for food you know you're not going to just be doing gardening you know yeah but it's going to be part of the effect of it you have to learn how to garden so when you first start out, you will want to make sure that you have people in place that know what they're doing and are willing to teach some of the others because they're not always, they may not always be there to do it. They may be sick. They may have, they may have uh, gotten too old to do it. There's going to be all kinds of reasoning behind it. But, and Anthony's a hundred percent right. Yeah. The best way to learn how to do it is, Start doing it now. I mean, even if you live in a tiny apartment, you can still grow something in buckets or something and learn learn the basics of it. Because trust me, if we uh, get in a SHTF situation, say the end of the world as we know it or anything like that, and you don't at least have the basics down, you're going to be kind of SOL in my book. Okay. Um Josh is talking about uh, stocking up on seeds, and um, uh, there was some talk about um, rotating crops, uh, having a greenhouse. Uh, what else was there? There's something else. Well, I'd like to tackle the seed thing, uh, if I could. Yeah. The... Uh, the main thing with the seeds that I really want to just kind of point out, and this, I mean, I'm sure y'all already know this, is just I want to say for those who may not, um, certain seeds are only viable for so long. So you can't just stash away a coffee can full of seeds and 10 years from now think that they're going to germinate because they won't. Uh, some seeds work better if they're stashed away and, you know, frozen. Um, others, they may not. You know, uh, cucumber seeds last a pretty long time, but you, you want to make sure you're constantly rotating out. And the good thing about it is at the end of the year, they go on clearance anyway. So if you just want to pick up $10 worth every year and just rotate them, you're, you'll be good to go. Not really big of a deal. So uh, when it comes down to growing things, you can't just stash away seeds and think you're going to be okay. You, you definitely want to practice, but having a greenhouse will definitely help you uh, extend your season, especially in them colder colder climates and don't forget about having the uh like a cold frame you don't have to build an entire greenhouse you can build something called a cold frame which is basically a raised bed with a glass piece on top that'll extend your season 
just by the amount that you're going to need. So it'll keep the frost off the plant uh, and it won't kill the plant. And you'll be able to harvest for a few more weeks. Uh, Gavin, no, we're not talking about growing channels. We're talking about um, growing. We have, uh, yeah, we have a raid in here. So I'm sure uh, it's from uh, Think Dragon, and he's trying to help us out in here. So just let him go. Yeah. Now, uh, Gavin was asking about, about uh, the title of the show. And if you yeah, if you actually look at what Kalen said, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Any people who do not have any land need to hook up with those who do. Uh, she's going to trade seeds and collect sm a small share of gardeners to harvest. So it, that's another thing is if you guys think about that, you know, if you definitely have one of those uh, rusted thumbs that don't work for, for nothing no matter what you try, you may want to think about putting together with somebody that does, and that's really going to help you out a lot. Because even if your thumb's all rusted out and everything, guess what? And that guy that knows what he's doing, somehow some of that's eventually going to wear off on you. It might take a few years or whatever, but it will wear off. And then you will be able to say, hey, it can be done, and then you'll be able to pass that on to somebody else. So it does, you know... Uh, it all comes into play, and Kaylin had a very good point there. Uh, Josh Connor said he wrote he has a rotational seed stock, just like his pantry. That's a good, very good idea, and now, as we mentioned that. So, if you have uh, seeds, make sure that you look on the back of the packet. You can, you know, those packets even tell you how long a season or how long of a growth uh, spurt they have in them. Some of them will last longer, i found, that I have one of those seal meals, and I've taken some of my seeds and sealed them up, and they did, they'll last longer there, but they still uh, have a shelf life. So if you do that to them, you need to make sure that you write down the date that you did it to them and make sure that you use them within a couple of years at least. And that's just a common sense type of thing. Okay, now I have a question because I've heard um, that you should only collect heirloom seeds um, because if you if they're not heirloom seeds and I'm, I may have this backwards that you cannot harvest the seeds to you know get more seeds uh, in GMO or something like that if you collect GMO seeds or something like that you can't always get good, a good harvest of seeds for your next crop. You're going to use uh, the GMO seeds. Those you have to make sure that you use every year. You can't stash them away. And you're not even guaranteed. You're not even going to be guaranteed that those will grow. Heirloom are actually the best ones. Right. And so you want to collect heirloom. Heirlooms are the ones you want to uh, put in your stash and make sure that you, if you're going to save them, uh, for maybe one, maybe two years, make sure you're vacuum sealing them up so that they're not uh, losing their germination power, you know. But you're going to still have to rotate those out. I don't, two years maximum. I would not I would not store anything past two years. Yeah. Well, the, the heirloom seeds are good because it's what we call an open pollinated variety to where the, the seed is going to be the same as the, the, the parent plant. If you get one of those that's uh, that cross pollinates like a hybrid, then you may not get the same plant you got with the seed. So, uh, a hybrid pepper. If you collect the seed from that, you might grow one of the parents of that hybrid, not the actual hybrid. That's the that's the point of that. That's why you want to grow an heirloom variety because it's going to be the same plant that you get the seed from. I don't. Think yeah, it would be sense. like a it would be like a clone exactly. Yeah. 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 We uh, have Mr. Dan. Uh, D Mac has joined us, you guys. How's it going, guys? Sorry, I'm a What's little up? late. I'm gonna do uh do some stuff around the house. So. Uh, How I dare you? Make it. Okay, Josh. I yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure how that exactly worked. That's why I brought that up. So. Right he start. said uh, that if, that you can collect seeds, but. And then he uh, was talking about what you guys were talking about. So, 
Yeah, you want to make sure that you, that you don't keep them very long. That's the bad thing about seeds. Uh, and I don't know how, how you other guys feel about this, but uh, you could collect, you could take some of your plants that you grow in your garden or in your area of garden, whatever you want to call it, your field, and you could make those go to seed, and then you could save those seeds for the next growing season, but you can't uh, just keep doing that from the same seed. Because when you do that, then you start getting, uh, it's not getting the nutrition in it that it's supposed to be getting. It would be the best way I know how to put it. Is well, I can, uh, I've saved seed from the same plant over and over again. Uh, well, it's not usually the same plant. Usually it's, you grow a row and you take the strongest one. But the reason why you do that is so you can uh, change the genetic makeup of that plant so it'll work to your climate. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does it to does. me. Uh, it, does it, anybody in the acclimate. side chat uh, have questions about that? No. It, it'll uh, it'll acclimate acclimate itself to your climate when you do that. So the more you save seed, the easier that plant's going to grow the next year, and uh, it's actually a really good thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, and see, I wasn't exactly sure how that worked. That's why I brought it up. I knew there was something with it, but that's why I brought it up. Cause, yeah, uh, the big difference is with fruit trees. Since most fruit trees are grown on rootstock of something else, um, the seed might not give you what, you what you're looking for. So you can't just go out and plant an apple seed from a tree, uh, from an apple you got from the grocery store because it might not give you uh, an apple that bears fruit. You know, it might just be from that weird rootstock or across from something else so just keep that part in mind yeah well most time the the fruit you get in stores has already been uh what they call that neutralized when they can't remember we need sue nelson here she'd know like <laughs> sterilize they sterilize it you know so that people can't grow from them because they don't want people putting them out of business you know they're just uh there's a lot of times i bought uh, plants or from the store i've tried to grow the seed and it just it'll grow but there it won't bear fruit so yeah, usually they'll early. if they pick it early then uh the seed doesn't mature and it won't it'll be worthless so yeah. it won't be you know cool, but, well yeah. it'll grow but it won't for pr pr produce anything something will be wrong with it nutritious Okay, now we have two things uncle al is saying acre size and then there was also uh Crafty AZ is saying process to in saving the seeds. Do you think, Anthony? Process to save the seeds. I'm trying to look That's at it. What a, it's. Oh, I got you. Okay. Okay. Um, depends on which seed one. you're talking about. Yep, yeah, I got it right there. Yeah. It all depends on which seed you're talking about because uh, if there's certain ones like uh, a pepper, you can just take the seed out and dry them and you're good to go. But there's other ones like cucumber and tomato. They have that little jelly-like substance on there and you got to leave those out and let a mold kind of grow on that jelly-like substance for like a few days and then you can wash that mold off and the jelly will come off with it and you can dry the seed that way. Um, you can't just take the seeds from those plants and then stash them because if that jelly's on there then they're never going to germinate so that's why you got to get rid of that from the get-go but then you have ones like uh potatoes that you don't even need a seed for you can just take that potato and toss it back in the ground and you're good to go it all depends what you're talking about um uh, and then uh c103 is saying certain things such as different beans can cross pollinate and ruin seeds in, even if heirloom Cross pollination could be a good thing, but it can be a terrible thing at the same time. Yeah. Cucumbers, any curcubit will do that. So if you plant cucumbers next to squash, you might get a crazy hybrid by accident because the bees visited both plants simultaneously. And next thing you know, you got you know yellow cucumbers or green yellow squash. And you're like, what's going on? And yeah, they can do that. And then you, Uncle Al, you can Al. weigh in any time, D Mac. I'm, hey man, I'm like I'm I'm listening when it comes to this. <laughs> and I am uh, 
Absolutely, I have I have not a whole lot to add when it comes to. Uh, That's why you got all those boxes of food, food, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, uh, while you can, man, learn while you can. I I understand, like I, I like I know how to like plant stuff in soil and make it grow, but that's about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then Uncle Al, brought, uh, Uncle Al brought up land, amount of land that's needed. Not yeah, only the, that, uh, rotation also. Somebody the, brought that up. The main thing with land that you're going to really want to focus on, especially if you grow something like corn, um, corn is pollinated by the wind. So that's why you usually see them grow in rows. That way the wind can blow the pollen from the top of the plant down to the tassels. Uh, so a lot more land is going to be required. Same with like something like wheat um, or buckwheat and that kind of thing, like the staple grains. Um, and when it comes to rotation, definitely rotate your plants every year because the insects that, that have, infect your plant this year uh some of them will fall off the plant and overwinter it was called overwinter in the soil and that way the next year when you plant the same plant they're just going to crawl right up the stock and kill it before it even gets anything so by rotating you <laughs> discourage overwintering of insects because say a, uh, an insect that's really bad at or that you know really attacks like potatoes or tomatoes like a nightshade uh if you plant a bean there that next year they don't like beans, so they'll die, and you're fine. Also, some plants put off, uh, like they use more calcium or lime or whatever. They all produce that naturally, so you may want to rotate something of that out. So another bring in a plant that doesn't use that or might need that to uh, to grow the next year. Something like yeah, that. yeah potassium stuff like that, because some plants just put that stuff off. Uh, off while they're growing and then that gets yeah. into the, the ground and then the next year you may want to take that plant out and plant that somewhere else that where it needs it in that soil and bring another plant over that could use that same uh, chemical or yeah chemical i guess it is so that you're always always cross cross planting to make everything grow to its maximum yeah, like beans and peas are the ones that give off nitrogen. They make nitrogen to put in the soil for the heavy feeders like a tomato or a corn. So, okay, uh, Gavin, what are the? Are you talking about viruses in plants? What viruses are you talking about? He says in Massachusetts there are deadly viruses. Well, it's not just Massachusetts; it's everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, bugs, the bugs too, the bugs that get in there and they will hibernate in the dirt. Yeah, the uh, when it comes down to viruses, um, there are certain ones that are susceptible to certain things. That's why the heirloom seeds may not work in some areas and hybrids work better uh, because they may have been, you know, cross bred to discourage that certain virus. Uh, the one I can think of is like most of your squashes. Uh, if cucumber beetles attack them, they'll get that yellowing brown spot or like powdery mildew, that kind of thing. Uh, you got to watch out for funguses just as much as you got to watch out for viruses. Uh, I, In my area, since I, it's humidity is a big factor, uh, funguses are a little bit more prevalent than viruses. But uh, you still got to keep your plants healthy, watered. Uh, I mean, we, we can talk to howie or somebody about keeping your plants healthy but yeah you definitely want to make sure you recognize a virus or a mold or a, a fungus that way you can rip that plant out so it doesn't infect the rest of them yep definitely and there's all kinds of things you can do to keep them healthy but like i said we need the ffp here or somebody let's uh let's go to the next one i'm going to use the next two together and yeah. we'll try to do like uh 30 minutes on that and then I think the rest of them will just kind of try to skip through because they're not very much but let's put hunting and raising uh, animals for food because those kind of go hand in hand and I'm going to have Mr. Dan start this one out because he knows about this uh, situation well I wouldn't necessarily know much about like raising animals for, for stock I do know a thing or two about hunting I've uh, been hunting for uh, the better part of my life. Um, it's it's obviously really important that you, uh, you know, if you are going to, uh, I 
fitness, you know, hunt uh, for your group or for uh, for meat collection that you you know you do it with the the the, the right I guess uh, tools at hand not necessarily tools but skills you know you want to make make sure you know um, how to track the animals how to how to recognize bed sites how to how to recognize migration trails so that you can uh, effectively kind of follow herds around so that you can take take those animals you know i uh i had the the benefit of hunting out west for the last 10 years so i i I had a lot of big country hunting and you know we didn't do a whole lot of elk is mostly mule deer because it was uh cheaper and easier to get the tags for for mule deer than it was for elk so um and you don't have to work as hard for for mule deer as you do for, for elk but uh you know hunting's really important because you're going to want to be able to stock your freezer uh with protein um but you need to know to, how to be able to really preserve that and how like you know hunting's not going to be you're not going to be able to go out i mean realistically if if you're talking about about a uh like a a balloon up situation hunting is not going to be the way that it is right now you know the 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 hunting that i know and the the hunting that i have <clears throat> been able to enjoy my life is not going to be the same at all um once that goes up because everybody's going to be you know scavenging for those resources so so you're going to have to to think differently than you than you do as a recreational hunter now uh, obviously you're going to benefit from the skills that you gain from from being recreational um in the moment so that's why i suggest get out there and start hunting and, and using you know the the tools and, and gaining the skills now so that you can try to be able to uh, have a fighting chance um if if you're having to contend with the the rest of the globe for those resources so um you know that's where you're going to want to be realistic and go to like raising stock and, and and trying to to keep that on the homestead so that you don't have to to go out and hunt you don't have to leave your you know you, if you're going to build a castle and build a keep you're going to want to kind of stay close to that so you can protect the resources you have and so so raising you know quail rabbits whatever chickens whatever it is you can raise in your area like that's what you're going to want to start doing now i would assume uh because that's going to be the most effective way for you to be able to have meat uh, in any sort of grid down situation because you're not going to want to go out and, and be hunting with with your rifle trying to gain meat and stuff when, when everyone else is doing the same thing because you you look like a taste of the game. So. well hunting actually i think uh, if we were in that like grid down thing or kiowaki whatever hunting really won't be called hunting anymore it'll be harvesting because you'll be wanting to make sure that uh, you're harvesting like you are a garden. You only want to harvest what you need so you can leave some for the next time. That's my thinking anyway. Yeah, uh, Josh brought up uh, uh, trapping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, learn how to trap. That's very important. Oh, trapping is a good one. Especially when it comes to small game because you don't got, you know, you got to figure the time that's going to take to to do a lot of this it, actively hunting is going to take all day and there's plenty of other things to do. So if you're trapping, you can set something, go back and do something else and come back. It's absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. So that's what I'm talking about. The growth of your group is everyone has something to bring to the table. Yep. So you're going to have people in the, in the garden area, just hoeing and weeding and, and harvesting whatever they have to do. Then you're going to have the, the uh, game harvesters that are going out and trying to bring some meat in and that uh, put up for everybody to have over the winter or whatever. And then, then you're going to be trying to figure out how you're going to bring some cows and chickens and ducks and all this stuff in and try to uh, keep those all harnessed in too. You know, that's why it all kind of runs together. These first, first three items that I have written down here is, you put them all together that's going to take quite a few people out of your group you know yeah you know and that's what you have to do is bottom line is all the people that you've assimilated into your group 
are all going to have to have a function, and that's what everybody does every day. So, you know, you're not looking around saying, hey, how come Billy's over there sitting down? <laughs> you know, everybody's doing something. Livestock is definitely very, very important, and Dan definitely hit it. Uh, if you can stay at the you know house and do something else and know that your meat's taken care of with livestock, by all means, that's the best thing to do because we move from – hunter-gatherer to agrarian society with livestock and, and planting gardens and stuff for a reason um, because it's just everything's just there uh, and I highly suggest if you have the space to start off simple with something like chickens they're really easy you can always start off with like two or three um, get it you know because chickens will lay in the summertime an egg the most breeds will lay an egg once a day usually once every 25, 26 hours. Uh, so they, you know, they're actually less work than a dog in reality. Cause you just make sure they got food and water and they can basically take care of themselves as long as they got a good uh, coop. So um, that, yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, 1900, the depression, there was hardcore wiping out of, of animals. Absolutely. Oh yeah. And that, that's absolutely going to happen if it happens again. You know, if you have a big economic, you know, depression where, where you're not getting supply chain filled and you have infrastructure collapse, mm -hmm. it, which is not unreasonable to think that happens. If you, if you see the truck stop moving, if you see the oil stop flowing, if you see the electricity, electricity stop, you know, you know, buzzing and stuff like that. So it's, like it, it's really easy to assume that that you that you're gonna see those animals go away real quick, you know, because they're already skittish from the last go around, and they, you know, they've they've become harder to hunt, and we've had to 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 do a lot of um, resource management on a on a you know on a national level just to to keep the herds alive as they are now, so that we can go and hunt them. You know, especially some of those bigger game animals where they used to be, you know, millions and now there's thousands. So that's, you know, it's a big change. And, yeah, and you can are. totally see that's going to absolutely they're, they're going to disappear quickly if if everyone's trying to, to eat. Yep. It's going to go down, yep, it's gonna go down really quickly. That's why I said the, the hunter hunter gatherers, whatever you want to call them have to be able to go out there and just gather what you want. <laughs> Excuse me, you're not really, you know, uh, you may not be able to get the big game, you know, depends on the area you live well, in. And that's, and that's and some, it's some, some areas good. don't have the big game, they just have the smaller game. And this, is, and this is why it's important for you to have your, you know, your six month to a year, whatever, how long food supply, you want to call it i call it a year realistically um it's not that hard to have a, a year it is not going to be exciting food but you can have a year's worth of food if you have the space easily enough um yes. so so with that you know if you have if you know you've got sustenance for you know six seven eight months you can focus on you know on on fortifying and enhancing the the output of your homestead instead of having to go out and gather and hunt and scavenge because you'll already have the systems in place to just kind of get into that mode of not going to the office nine to five but clocking in in the garden from sun up to sundown so yeah. so it's obviously going to be a little bit different for a lot of people that aren't out there doing it regularly, but it's going to be a lot easier for you to assimilate if if you have supplies on hand to not have to go and scavenge. That's why I said that kind of kind of goes in hand in hand because you don't want to really do any hunting if you don't have to because uh, it's going to be hunted out pretty quick anyway. You, anybody that uh, is going to be real about it is going to know that most wild game are going to disappear fairly quickly for the People that Prep didn't prepare, <laughs> they're going to go out and try to get what they can. Prep for it, what? I was just saying howdy to prep for it and oh, Steve. Yeah. They just came in with Steven. So, so they go, those people are going to go out there and they're going to just kill, kill, kill because that's the only skill set that they're going to have, you know. So yeah. you really have to think about 
uh, as soon as you got all your group assimilated, you got the people out in the garden doing their thing. You got the hunter gatherers out there. Then you've got the people raising the animals. And there's where you really come in is you're going to have to make sure you have uh, goats and cows and stuff like that for milk and other produce. I just uh, saw something on TV saying that uh, we need to start eating 90% less meat. Mm -hmm. uh, as humans need to eat, not start eating 90% uh, less meat because we over, 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 I can't remember what the guy said, but we eat 90% too much meat. Over consume. Over consume, yeah. Yeah. We, we do eat a lot of meat, and unfortunately, that meat takes a lot of uh, grains and whatnot to make it. So I'm not saying do away with me because I'm very much a big fan of eating, you know, a nice big juicy I, steak. I like my t yeah. <laughs> I like I like meat, uh, and meat has a lot of uh, very essential vitamins like B12 that you can't get from vegetables. You have to eat meat. But uh, you also have to understand that we do eat way too much in a, in every day. I mean, look at how many people eat burgers every day. You know, you don't need that much. That's why we're getting Good. sick. There it is. See, that's what this, uh, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> well, yeah, that was a big problem in uh, the 17 and 1800s was having turf wars with neighbors, just uh, establishing property lines. And you know darn well that if we get in that situation without law, Property line disputes are going to be everywhere. I'm telling you, they're going to say, this is mine. Don't come across mm -hmm. there. Yep. So even, you know, orchards that you may have planted on your own property, someone very well could try to take your land. So be prepared for those kind of disputes when it comes down to it, because uh, that's very likely to happen. And you're going to need to have, you know, a trade with everyone around you. You know, your group might not be the only group in the area. You might have other groups that may not agree with you, but they're still within distance to trade with. So while you may grow grain, you know, uh, say you want to grow wheat, they may grow corn and you can trade out. That way you're both not eating the same crap all the time. So it, it'll pay off too. It's uh, what and purpose, man. He says six ounce protein. <laughs> yep, six ounce protein, three ounce veg, three ounce fruit, and uh, for muscle based workout. Yeah, but when it comes down to a SHGF scenario, you know darn well you're going to be eating whatever you can. Probably will be. You'll probably, but yeah, I'll bet you'll probably be eating less meat. I bet you would. Yeah. Well, you're going to, I mean, just the scarcity of it. It's going to be a lot easier to uh, prolong or want to prolong that just so you have it for the next day and the next day and the next day instead of eating it all at one time. Yeah. And that's where the skills of uh, preserving and canning and things like that come in. Yep, dehydration, that kind of thing, because uh, you want to yeah. make sure that that Smoking. one kill that you may have you know, that mule deer that Dan killed, you want to make sure that you have, that you're dehydrating what you can, canning what you can if you have the abilities to. That way that deer will stretch for a month versus three days. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you, get got, the, so you got your... Going, get the smoker going as well. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of smoke in the meat, yep, mm -hmm. to get it to last, yep, to cure it, yep. So now you got your big group assimilated. You got your agriculture out there. You got your hunter gatherers, right? You got uh, the people in there inside the group uh, raising chickens and goats and rabbits and all that good stuff. Now you have to have some foragers mm -hmm. so they can go out and forage for like herbs and stuff for medicines and stuff. Yep. Right. That's a that's a big one too, especially when it comes down to the things that grow that aren't really cultivated like crops that grow wild. Uh, I mean, stuff like plantain, dandelion, and, you know, others yeah, out there. You have to know here. what your ecosystem is, where you're at. They're very uh, medicinal stuff out there that grows like in the cracks of pavement. <laughs> like you want to <laughs> know what those are, you know, just so you, just in case you do have an issue, boom, I know exactly what that looks for. So that's another thing you can, you need to study now 
at least get one book of wild edibles to be like, hey, you know what? Just in case this happens, I can refer back to this physical book to find something that looks like that. <laughs> Prep for it, butcher maker, candlestick maker, beekeeper, security, good topic. Yep, we're there. Prep for it. Well, and uh, the uh, foraging works for uh, not only food but medicinal. And as far as that, make sure that you know know your foraging. And uh, Anthony's got it right. Is uh, I have a, a a book on it, but it's one of those audio books. I just plug into it, and listen to it okay, whenever I get bored from this stuff. <laughs> And I don't want to watch TV, and that happens a lot, so I'll just plug into one of my Audible books. But I think a person should probably have a hardback. I've been thinking about starting a, uh, starting a collection of books on this stuff, because I just like to listen to it. I'll just sit on the couch. The kid will be at work, and the uh, other half will be at work, and I'll just be the only one here, and I'll just plug in, you know. And it's a good way for me just to go away somewhere else, you know. But I've been thinking about getting books because I don't like to read, but they may come in handy down the road, you know. I'm not always going to have a, a earpiece to plug into. There's there's two there's two really good books that I would definitely recommend, and the the main one is either the the Scouts Manual or the U.S. Survival Manual, the Army Survival Manual. They both have pictures and things of things that you should be looking for. Yep, I got a Scouts Manual. That way manual. you can, yeah, that way you can just. Just the, you know, the main stuff, but be careful with mushrooms. If you don't recognize it and you can't positively identify it, do not eat it. You can oh, die. Yeah, I and had I had the mushroom book too, but somebody stole it. That was a yeah. nice book too, man. It showed everything. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, you, said a re- you said a really good thing there, Anthony. Uh, the Boy Scout manual, like, like totally go find a Boy Scout handbook from like. 1989 like 1970 whatever like go get some of the older publication ones because dude you will learn so much from it from in those books even the new ones the old publications like like get merit badge books for it because there's like really really well outlined information on on all those survival type of topics in yeah in i've got time. one i got one from 1962 and you know how i got it I took my son to a Boy Scout camp one time, and I, uh, because I was just starting to get COPD, they let me stay up where, uh, where the counselors stay. And so I was up there, and I was looking through the books and stuff, and I found this real old Boy Scout book. So I was talking to one of the guys inside, and I go, what do you guys, where do you guys find all those books and stuff? And he goes, oh, those books have been here for years. Nobody reads them. He said, they're just out there to keep them out of the way and i said well i found one out there i was kind of interested in he goes ah just take it home with you that's how i got it (laughs) i'm from from 1962 i mean it has the stuff that my son's newer book doesn't have in it you know i am constantly looking at thrift stores for the old you know boy scout manuals and the uh the fox fire series because those things can come in handy if you can find those and it's funny it's it's funny you say that because I've been working like I picked this one up at a uh, a thrift store a couple of years ago it's a paramedic like uh textbook mm-hmm. and so I've, I've literally been reading through a paramedic's textbook for the last year and a half just just learning emergency medicine through this at least as well it's you know it's why not I like to read and this is a great read so resources they're going to need every one you got if you can stop i mean if you got the space for it by all means stock up on it because it, it could be invaluable if you need that one answer <laughs> anything like, else out there cheryl that i'm missing no not really everybody doing all right out there because sometimes we get to talking and yeah. i miss i miss some stuff yeah. i see steve's in here how you doing corsair Steve did say that the older books have more stuff in them. Uh, and, you know, speaking of... Uh, you can read the stuff, pictures better, too. <laughs> uh, I found a, an old uh, book on uh, 
diseases that livestock can get. And I picked it up at a thrift store and I'm hanging on to that because we don't know what kind of issues that livestock could have, you know, in a, in a worst case scenario and any kind of information that we could come up with on things like that is very important, I think. And Jeep Things, uh, Johnny out there, Jeep Things Outdoors, he said he wished he could find out more about edibles, wild edibles. And all you got to do is uh, go on Amazon or eBay and find those, John. They, yeah, there's all kinds of books available. Yeah, it depends on your location. There's going to be books that are going to be like, I have a, a book called Southeast Foraging, and they're pretty good uh, depending on where you, what location you are. Uh, just be careful for lookalikes because there's a lot of stuff out there that looks alike. And, also, uh, if you go to swap meets, you can find books too. And that's yeah. and that's exactly what like you know Anthony hit on. Like obviously, like I randomly have my kind of such a dork dude. I have like all my stuff right around me. So like, <laughs> I'm like, but like in my in my hiking pack, I have I'm obviously in the south now, but this is like from the mountain west. But I have the uh, the edible medicinal plants of the west. It's just a field book. It's got really good pictures. It's like it's pretty yeah. good at helping identify like wild edibles and stuff like that. And that's fun. But you're like, it, if you really want to be safe, you're going to want to like dig a little bit deeper than just looking at some pictures because there is a lot of lookalikes that can lookalikes that can really mess you up if you uh, if you use the wrong yeah. plan. So, well, here's something I found. Uh, it says that. Not all not all wild plants are edible at all times of the year. You want to make sure that uh, you're picking the right ones at the right time of the year because some yeah. edible leaves are toxic certain times of the year and vice versa. So that would be rhubarb. good to know. Look at rhubarb. If you uh, if you eat the stalk, you're good to go. If you eat the leaf, you're going to be very, very sick. And yeah. there's just certain parts of the plant that you can't eat on some things. And like dandelion, you can eat the whole thing. No big deal. But uh, things like uh, blueberry, people think, oh, I got blueberries and it's uh, it's fall. Well, no, 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 no. Blueberries are done by like early summer. So you want to make sure you know what wild edibles are going to be around during that certain time. Because if you see something that looks like a blueberry in November, that probably ain't blueberry. Yeah. The other thing is, if you're going to be out there foraging for them, make sure you leave some for next time. <laughs> They have to regrow, you know. A lot of people yep. go out there and just scarf everything up, you know. They don't think about the next time. Especially with mushrooms. If you are a chanterelle kind of person, like you can find <laughs> those if you're in the up north. You make sure you don't take every chanterelle because you want them, that whole spot to be there next year. That's yeah, true fact, yep. I used to go looking for those things every year when I lived in Washington. I love chanterelles. They're too hot down here. We don't get them. But uh, I remember when I was up in Virginia on a on a debt, and we went out in the woods. It was that perfect time of year, and I was finding some chanterelles. I was so excited. <laughs> and, you know, uh, there are a lot of books that uh, will tell you how to not only find them, identify them, but how to use them, um, mm -hmm. like not uh, for medicinal, uh, for cooking, for all kinds of things. So uh, there is actually a lot of them that are good for medicinal purposes. Yeah, and you're gonna need uh, you're gonna need that knowledge when uh, you go to start your group and stuff, and your group gets together and you start putting everything together, then. When you're out foraging, that's you're gonna need the people with you when you're out foraging to know uh, what to look for for the medicinal plants and stuff because some of them you can't eat, but you can use them for medicine. You know, they can be prepared in different ways and then uh, become a medicine. It's like uh, I think that milk plant can be used as a pain reliever if you do it right. You know. Yeah, well, that's the other point too is you've got to know how to do it. You've got to know how to prepare. Well, that that prepare. comes into the book learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Either having the book or knowing from a book. Yeah, I tried unsuccessfully with uh, acorns recently. Um, I got to get another batch because you can read it all day. Uh, hey, yeah, you can eat acorns. Cool. But you got there's a process to it. And if you don't know the process <laughs> right, 
Yeah. Oh, another thing you know, like crap. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought I had the tannic acid washed out just fine. I had, I mean, I rinsed them several times. Tony, Tony. And no. Uh, Give me a five. Second. I didn't rinse it out just enough, so when I dried everything out and I put it into a powder and I made a little cake with it, it tasted like horrible. Still just... <laughs> yeah. My grandpa used to tell me about the acorns. Oh, you could just eat those. He'd <coughs> crack one, you know, and he'd put it in his mouth. I don't know how he would get through that taste, man. Then he told me years later, you know, oh, yeah, there's a way you got to cook them and stuff like that. You got to grind them yep. up. You got to put them in the oven. And blah, 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 blah. Yep. You got to roast them, and then you got to put them into a powder. But you got to leach the tannic acid out of them by soaking it in water. And you got to change that water out several times. Uh, and then you got to let it dry. Like, you can't let them mildew uh, by being soaking wet. So you let them air dry. And with moving air, it's just a big process. Then definitely gave the Native Americans a lot of uh, – a lot of props after that. <laughs> I yeah. failed. And uh, Kaylin said some of you use topically in salves, ointments, and poultices. Yep, poultices, all that medicinal stuff. Yeah. We yeah. did cover uh, the plants going to be in medicine, but we also need to talk just about medicine, making sure that even though... Uh, even though you take medicine now, you can stockpile it back for later. I I have already started doing that for myself, so if I can do it, anybody can. Well, Hoople's yeah. has got that great video. Remember that video? Yep. Yeah, I definitely would refer to that thing about how long medication will last. Cause, uh, It'll last virtually forever. Some you, of them. If you store it right, yep. yep. So, it's all uh, in that how video. you store it. That video is very enlightening, and I really appreciate that. If he's in here, you know that was a good video. I can't believe he didn't come in here. He might be working. Um. All right. So the next one is uh, while we have all the stuff put together, now everybody's out there doing their thing. We still need some people put together that can do the mechanic and or the engineering to put uh, buildings up or to make uh, mechanical devices to, like, grind up the wheat and all that stuff. Yep. That's, uh, that's the one thing I wanted to mention when it came to learning your history, because the reason why cultures were able to turn into you know the, the stone what we call mega uh, monolithic cultures where they were able to build out of stone was because the town or the civilization they were in was able to grow enough food for them to be able to do something else like that's the main point you know you gotta you gotta hit here like if you don't grow enough food you're gonna be focused on nothing but growing food so you gotta make sure that you're you're getting enough of that so you can afford to keep somebody building things and working on cars and all that fun stuff. I'm a mechanic by trade, so obviously that's what I want to do. But hey. Not only that, you're going to have to have engineers there to build buildings and uh, kind of put, I don't know, my idea is that if you've got a group like that and they're all starting to put things together, they're pretty much outside the city limits and they're probably going to have to start, I don't know, basically from scratch. There may be some standing buildings out there but not all of them probably some of them are going to be done in or have to be rebuilt or something like that and it, and it sounds crazy because when you think like as a as an average person like man how can i ever learn to go like build a house or like put this together like especially if you're just kind of doing the standard monday nine to five type of thing but that's what like that's when you can go out and do Habitat for Humanity. Like, it's it's funny that you guys kind of say that because the, the wife and I and, and my in-laws and everything, like, we're scheduled to do a couple of Habitat for Humanities throughout the uh, the fall season here. And, and, you know, who knows what we'll be doing on site there, but we'll be helping build a house at some level, at some capacity. And, and if you're just exposed to that and you can see what's going on and see what goes into putting up uh, a structure like that, 
and, and be able to provide service at the same time, you know, that's a win-win for, for you. So, so that's a way that you can expose yourself to being able to learn how to do something bigger than you could think pretty easily. So. You know, if you're going to have this livestock, somebody's going to have to build that barn. <laughs> somebody's yeah. going to have to come up with the idea of how everything goes together to build that barn. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you're gonna, gonna have, have to your materials. Yep. Well, you're gonna, they're not gonna have any lumber yards. They're gonna have to figure out how to make the lumber out of trees. Go back to the old school and how to split and. All right, yeah, or go go tear down another building to build what you need where you need it. Yep. That's I'm another not. thing people don't think about: the nails and screws that you're gonna need. Yep. Wow. Well. Yeah, and tools. Yeah, not, for the pioneers way back, you know, it was not uncommon for them to burn down their cabin so that they could sift through the ashes and pick up all the nails because they knew that they were like moving off westward or whatever. And it, like it was much easier for them to gather, gather all the hardware that way uh, because hardware was, you know, you have to have a blacksmith to make nails. You have to have a blacksmith to make, you know, all that sort of like, like, one of the hardest things to replicate outside of any other tool is like a file, a saw blade, and, and you know, and a couple other little things like that. But like, so you want to make sure you can <laughs> have have like hardware absolutely, so that you can put up your 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 storm shutters if if the hurricane is coming in or a tornado is coming in, you have time or whatever. To, so so that's definitely something that you want to consider having around your homestead is is firewood to, to protect your, your spot so come on honey let's have a bonfire no i did not uncle out i did not add baking i forgot to roast and i didn't add baking soda that's why it tasted horrible hey there's sue nelson what were we gonna ask her i don't remember now I don't either. You came in too too late. See, so we had a question for you. Now we got to remember it. Oh yeah, I do now. Do they uh, neutralize the seeds and those and the fruit that you take in that I send all over the place? Oh no, the world came to an end. C Dub came in too. Do you hear the question, Sue? Probably typing it out. We just got our moment of silence there, apparently. So. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I didn't know that about the, the burning the stuff down to get the nails, but it's funny. It makes sense. I find them all over the place. You see in all that. those movies where they're standing back watching the house burn down. I never thought about that. What yeah, about go pick, up, uh, go pick up your nails? So you don't make new ones. <laughs> you know, you you're gonna have to have someone that would be able to repair uh, the tools that you've got, and uh, if you if you can get the materials uh, to make new tools, so you, a blacksmith would fit in there too with the uh, mechanical and engineering and all of that. You're gonna need a blacksmith. Well, going back to history, I mean, you look at the, one of the most important jobs way back when, when it came down to troop movements to even small towns, they all had a blacksmith. It's very, very important. Yes. It's, uh, it's died out. These, well, I'll say died out. We're getting a bit of a resurgence now with knife making coming back, but a lot of blacksmithing uh, has been forgotten and it's lost art. It's unfortunate, but. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely come. Then the next thing I have written down is uh, defense and security. We need a Corsair up here for that one. I should have sent him a link. But anyway, you're still going to have to have that because you're, on top of everything, you got everybody working in your neighborhood. You got the gatherers out. You got the 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 far, the I guess they call that animal husbandry going. Mm -hmm. Uh, got the agriculture, got the foragers, you got the mechanics, 
now you need somebody to take care of all them people so they can work. Well, defense is definitely going to be a big priority even when you first get started. And it all depends on where you're located. If you are automatically start rural, you might have a little bit more time versus someone who might be in the suburbs because they're going to have to, you know, there's going to be your neighbors that are a bit greedy. But uh, when it comes down to the defense, like, you want to make sure you're stashing away your stuff now. That way you have at least a means to survive that initial push. Because uh, that's the main thing I'm worried about, depending on whatever the scenario is, is what is the initial push to make it all happen. Because it might be one of those slow things where everybody's like, oh, we're friends. And all of a sudden they turn on you on like day 21. I'm going to have so, to learn how to scuba dive so I can go get my gun out of the lake. I, I lost it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, me, bro. you make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of scuba divers out there, probably. <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure you're be able to set up a good perimeter as well, and just have good tactics. You want to, you know, you want to try to be at the top of a hill. That way, you can see who's coming at you. You don't want to have too many uh, open trails going towards your camp, so they can surround you kind of thing just simple stuff oh man well i'm totally gonna have to steal that and like run with my gun but oh my god that like that cracks me up oh man oh i'm, I uh, scuba diving to too, I'm, like, I'm totally gonna have to add scuba diving to my preps because it's obvious that i'm gonna have a boating accident here soon enough with the way the politics are going god dang absolutely <laughs> I was thinking that if you're having all this going on, there's going to be people noticing what's going on. They might be trying to sneak up on you. So I would think you'd need some snipers to, you know, just people that could get up high enough to kind of overlook everything. We That'd call be those guardian security, angels. Security detail, you know. Yeah. We call those guardian angels an overwatch position. That way you can do your thing down there. They got you up above. Yeah. Just have somebody sitting up there watching things go on, you know. God. Because <laughs> you're still going to have the guys walking around out there uh, trying to figure out how to get their scuba diving gear on. And you're still going to have to have somebody up top watching you put your scuba diving gear on. Well, you want to make sure you have a, a shift, too. You know, you, you, people are only going to be vigilant for so long. So. You will have to have those fire watches that night. So shift. then we would have to start making that our sheriff's department, right? But make sure you have your bucket brigade set up as well. Make sure you have your fire buckets and your, your shovels and stuff for that because fires are definitely going to be an issue. Um, so so fire suppression, I've always preached fire suppression as, as preparations because that's, that's one that sometimes gets overlooked that's going to be really important. Especially if everybody's cooking inside with open flame. All right, the next one's mental toughness. Who's going to have the mental good. toughness to kick people out if times get too rough, too rough, or to tell people they have to do things they don't want to do? That's going to be a big one. It's definitely going to be a big one. I mean, there's people right now that couldn't kill an animal if you gave them a weapon and said, do it. Like, they, they just can't justify in their head to do it. I mean, my wife's one of those, but, you know, it needs to be done. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people that just don't know how to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, same with uh, someone in your group that may be too far gone, you know. You have to know. It's, it's kind of morbid to think about, but you have to have that mental toughness to uh, be able to identify this kind of things and like, you know, hey, is it terminal? Am I stopping the suffering? That kind of thing. Like, this is the toughness crap that you got to think about. Like, absolutely. Or what if, uh, say, uh, something going on with the stock, the stock gets some sort of disease or something, and uh, you have to make that decision to quarantine the, the stock and that's going to take uh, away from your food preps. That's yep. going to make it uh, pretty tough to go out and say, hey, you guys can't have your cow today because it's got foot, and, foot, foot disease or whatever it is, foot and hoof yep. or whatever they call that. 
or uh, mastitis so you can't drink the milk. You got to pour the milk away for for three or four days until the mastitis clears up so you don't get sick, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to have to make sure that somebody is going to be there to be tough on that. And that's going to uh, come back to, I was wanting Reed to be here because <laughs> this was, I was where I was going to zap him good about the, the pod leadership that wasn't going to work if that happens, you know. Because when it comes down to this, the mental toughness is going to be the hard part. You know, even if you have the pods the way he was trying to put it together, is you're still going to have somebody out of each pod that has to go up and make like a council, right? So if you have the council, who's going to have the mental toughness to go out there and tell their people, okay, there are five of us up there and we're saying you all have to give up your livestock or something like that, you know? That's where it'll all, uh, I mean, hard decisions have to be made, unfortunately. This, is, this isn't one of those things where we can think everything's going to be hunky-dunky. Uh, you, you have to know, though, like if you are in that situation with the, with the pods. Um, I actually don't think the pods would work. Well, I think, it, I think it, there's no ideal situation. The thing I liked about the pods is it's uh, – it's probably one of the better of the scenarios versus straight up like monarchy or lord or something like that because at least people have a voice and if people have a voice then they're going to be less inclined to revolt and you know do a coup that kind of thing so it, it giving people at least the semblance of having a, a say in something will help out a lot uh especially when it comes to mentally being able to do these kind of things so that's a lot so you know, it, it's funny that you, you say all that because when we were talking about like like government structure of, of groups in our last chat, you know, I started kind of doing some thinking about it and I watched some videos and the guy that I love to hate and hate to love type of thing, but I watched a nut and fancy, nut and fancy video that he just did recently about like rules for WROL. And it was an excellent video. Like he really nails it on the head about how you should build a council and represent, you know, this, that, whatever. Like, so like you should go and check out his video uh, about that if you're interested in, in group government and group dynamics uh, as well, because he really, he really put together a pretty well thought out uh, piece there. So, what's the name of it? I'll have to look it up real quick. Let me find yeah, it. Yeah, just send me, send me an email, Dan. Yeah, I will. Yeah, the, the thing with when it comes to dictatorships, you don't want to end up like a Julius Caesar. You know, everybody smiles yeah. to your face, and then you got 30 people stabbing you. Cause, well, you know, you're going to have to have some sort of order. So even if you have to elect the officials, even back in the cowboy and Indian days, they elected officials. Yeah, you just want to make sure that your people are getting a voice and they're not being unheard. If they if they feel like they're not being heard, there's a really good chance that they can either – leave you hanging or that kind of bad you know something bad could happen to you so so that will bring us down to the very last thing then because we uh the ability to be able to work together yeah so if you big guys to be able to work together you'd be able to get through the mental toughness and then you could have your it wouldn't be an anarchy it would be whatever you decided the pod idea or maybe just hot hiring officials because you've already got like the people for agriculture hunting, the uh, animal husbandry stuff, the foraging, the medicine. So you have a doctor. It'd be like you have your own little town set up so you could actually go ahead and just let people run for office and elect them because you yeah. have to learn to have the ability to work together. Well, I think realistically, like what, it, you know, if, and I hate to go religious with it because it's not my intention to go religious. But like when you go to church with your family, if if it's something that you've done as a kid or as an adult, whatever, you know, it's it's a really it's kind of an easy way to see how groups assimilate because it's like families coming together and learning to communicate. And, and so like uh, an SHTF situation, if you're trying to assimilate members into group this or whatever, you can almost kind of look at it like like that. It's going to be a union of different groups of people that are coming together that have different ideas, but kind of have the same idea because we all want to survive. So so you're going to want to to have 
representatives for each of the major little cliques, the major pods, the major whatever the heck you want to what choose your nomenclature. Um, you know, you're going to want to have like a certain number of representatives per per click there at the at the grand council so that you can get these major decisions decided on how things should operate so that you guys can truly maximize your output. So, cause that's the, like, that's the whole goal of survival is to thrive. And, and so, and you're trying to think of how to like, how to do more with less and how to make it easier than it was before, how to make technology work for your advantage. So, so capitalize on whatever technology you have available and make it work harder and stronger for you. And that's how you're going to succeed. So um, that's important to think when you're trying to build a, a, a group dynamic. So it sounds like we kind of got it all put together. Everybody is under the same assumption, I think, anyway, about the end result is everybody has to work together and figure out how they're going to have their structure put, right? So it yeah. have to be everybody. So in the, in the uh, let me try to get this in the right wording without kicking myself in the butt, was now we've built and assimilated a group uh, that will... By the time they get to the point of the ability to work together, they'll know what kind of uh, uh, structure they need for the leadership of it, right? Yeah, after a certain amount of time. And it could always change because you're always going to want it to be better, right? Well, yeah, you want to improve. I mean, you just got to remember that things aren't going to be, you know, ideal all the time. And there will be disagreements and you got to figure out how you're going to handle that and a nice calm way if possible so uh the the ideal the idealist in me wants to think that everybody would move forward to a common goal but the realist in me would say that there's going to be those headbutts so you want to make sure you're prepared for that yeah uncle al did we forgot that resources are depleted that's the thing you have to consider like right now it's reasonable to think that you can work it out because like you can still go to walmart and buy a twinkie uh, but when you can't go to Walmart and buy a Twinkie anymore, it's going to be a little bit different at that uh, that deliberation table right there. So, because because people's lives truly are going to be at stake at that point. Yep. Um, so so it's going to be a totally different ball game and a different playing field. And that's uh, kind of what I figured too, because at that point everybody's going to be on the same playing field, basically. You're starting, but, but at the same time, you're also going to recognize that everybody's on a hair trigger, and, and everybody's going to be kind of not wanting to get smoked at the first moment. So, so I like I like to think that's where diplomacy is truly going to reign. Uh, is is when you can actually you know communicate on a level with anybody. And, and be able to to find common ground so that you can move forward instead of backwards. Uh, that's obviously going to be really really tough, but but uh, that's the that's the goal. <laughs> yep. That's what Corsair said. That's, that's what I was trying to get you to see. <laughs> he also said integrated preparedness books are good for thinking about this stuff. Um, but yeah, that I was trying to get your your attention on that one. So, um. well, Uncle Al brought up the uh, the casualties and death rates, and you know, like like you said about Jamestown, but even whenever else, people are going to die. I mean, not everybody's going to make it, and you got to think next man up philosophy. <laughs> you can't just have one person good at something. People got to learn how to do multiple things so they can. Exactly. When we were talking about uh, mental toughness, Uncle Al, we were talking about mental toughness, about people have to uh, go out and tell the other people, hey, your cow's sick. You'd be the same thing with human beings. You'd have to go out there and say, hey, Joe, Joey over there on the corner has got the plague, and nobody can go over there and play with him today. <laughs> And, and that's something else that you're going to possibly have to consider in your preps that it's not often spoken about. But, um, you know, especially if you're in population dense areas trying to make it happen, you're going to have to think about uh, uh, 
uh, casualty containment, I guess, and so you're, you're definitely going to have to figure out how to uh, to work through that that biohazard uh, situation that you're definitely going to be faced with if there is widespread death. Because don't sink them in. Don't have, sink them in the lake because that's where my gun's at. <laughs> um, God, you're killing me with that one, man. No, um, you brought me to tears with that. Well, that, that, was, that one was good. Um, but yeah, you're really gonna want to to have to consider that because because that's gonna be an issue um, if 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 there's like pandemonium and havoc. Like if it if it's one of those like like cataclysmic style hit the fan situations then yeah you're gonna have to you know think about that uh that that part of the the equation yeah i was always thinking uh that if you're gonna have to deal with death they would have to be put far away from the others you know i i should have brought this up in the series because i always thought about when somebody dies you would take them farther away from the living part of the people Everybody's going to have their own religious sect uh, reasoning for uh, disposing of them. But if they are sick, you're going to have like a, a virus that uh, you can't contain. You're going to have to, uh, in my opinion, probably burn them. You know, pretty most of them exist for a reason. Burn them so that there can't be any any way the rest of you can get sick. But that is my opinion. But there's, then that comes back to the old adage that everybody's going to have their family ties or their religion that they have to deal with on on things, and that could be the sticky point right there. Another aspect of that is you're going to have to have somebody that's going to be able to deal with the mental issues of losing people, uh, you know, to keep the, you know, because... A mom loses her baby, guess what? You're going to have some issues there. So you're going to have to have someone in your group that's going to be able to deal with those kinds of issues and uh, keep keep the mental health healthy. Yeah, not only that, they're going to be down off the workforce if they're uh, depressed about losing someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, religious groups who refuse might have disease spread from it, though. <clears throat> I think that'll last very short. Uh, that once they realize that you know safety is paramount, uh, if they have to burn them, they'll burn them. If they have to bury them first, they'll bury them first. But yeah, group safety is paramount. Yeah, and I think most most people will see that in the worst case scenarios. In that um, situation, I would think so. I would hope so anyway. And you're going to have to think about the different diseases that come with dead bodies. You know, the the cholera, malaria, the you know typhoid, all that, whatever, whatever different. I don't, I don't know, obviously, all of them, but those are going to things that you're going to want to uh, probably start uh, thinking about if there is going to be a lot of uh, a death around so yeah how they die what they get mm. <laughs> i guess so that's the best way to put it yeah die natural. yeah they die of natural causes then you have a see and now they go mm -hmm. the fluffy healthy ones hey wes ass how's it going i see wes is in here full of Shenanigans again, huh? Yeah. Shenanigans. Never eat I, the sick skinny kid. Just I expect nothing less. Fluffy, healthy ones, yep. <laughs> I think hey, we got everything on my list, guys. Who else can think of something I missed? Yeah. If you're chubby in the, the end of the world, you're going to have a target pain in your back. I hate to say it. I was going to say, <laughs> nobody's going to be a chubby. Especially if it's been the end of the world for a while and you're chubby, you're going to have a big target on your back. So. Yeah, nobody's going to be chubby, I don't think. I mean, that one I, the priority. 
you won't be eating like you regularly do. So, well, that was always a sign of wealth. When uh, <laughs> yep. if, if you were pale and you were chubby, you were wealthy because you could stay inside and eat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Cruiser Max said, "Got to thin the herd somehow." Literally. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a point there. That's a good way to thin the herd out. Sure. Oh, and, then, and then Uncle Al brings up a good one, you know, like obviously hepatitis, but uh, rabies and, and, and animal diseases like that, you know, you're going to have to be watching out for all the rabid uh, raccoons and, and shit that, that don't get uh, uh, swallowed, sorry, that, 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 that don't get eaten up in the uh, the initial hunting scurry of the uh, the Great Plague. So, <laughs> so, so watch out for your rabid animals because that's going to really tear you up as well. <laughs> There's always going to be some sort of issue, but pretty much got this section all, all squared away. If I missed anything, uh, somebody needs to say so, but we covered a lot. No, I think we did a good job. Anything from the side chat while we're here? I haven't seen anything. West only hunts vegans. Yeah. They'll be real skinny. Yeah. He was given uh, a long enough of time. Wes, Wes, do you really want to go hunting for protein deficient soy boy something or others? I don't think so. That, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. We don't want that grass fed stuff. I want like my 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 hearty meat. So <laughs> we came up with a new a new prep, Wes. You have to learn how to scuba dive. That's a new prep you have to learn. And so you can go after your gun in the lake. Just remember, vegan is someone who can't hunt. <laughs> Never trust a skinny cook. <laughs> How he said, that. rabies crossed with influenza and airborne is the zombie in the making. That's what nightmares are made out of. Yeah. Uncle Al said, "Hunt hogs, kids." Hunt hogs. I love hunting hogs. All right, if there's nothing else, we're gonna close this out. We went over, but I thought it was worth it. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Covered a lot of ground. That closes that one out, and we will get on to the next one for next time, you guys. All right. All right everybody have a good night. Thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure, guys. So. Thank y'all. All right. Night, everybody. Night. Later. All right.